The Spy is a fifth novel by British writer and Nobel laureate for literature William Golding. In his fifth novel, Golding renewed his interest in cloudy areas of human character, continuing his exploration of the human will requiring a universal sacrifice. Researchers of Golding works noted the symbols of his work. The novel The Spy is based on symbols. It acquires more and more new meanings. His relationship with Builder helps to understand the source and value of the human dream. William Golden novel The Spy takes us back to the Middle Age. The action takes place around the hero Jocelyn, the abbot of the Cathedral of the Virgin Mary. A spy will be built near the cathedral, but not everything goes smoothly. In the novel, there are also dramatic and sad moments as stated not even with the construction of a spy, but more with a human feeling. So, uh, the spy was published in 1964. William Golding uh, wrote the first draft of the spy in 14 days, itself a kind of a miracle. The dean of the cathedral, Jocelyn, wants to add the spy to the building. Uh, which has no foundation uh, and therefore is kind of miracle already. So the novel is about the second highly imperfect miracle, the erection of the spire and the cost, which is financial, physical and spiritual. And it's about create, creative realization, bringing the impossible into being. Hello there, my name is Mashrav Tarhan and talking about the plot, all the events in the book uh, took place in the 14th century in England and the main character was Jocelyn who wanted to build a spire. The spire which didn't have a foundation and she believed in a miracle that one day it will uh, finish. And the main uh, interesting part was that Jocelyn hired the workers who were not very religious and also these workers were drunk and violating the construction and uh, Jocelyn needed to always calm down other people. And But at the end of the day, construction never ended. The aunt told them the friendship with King helped to Jocelyn. Also, Ansel is so close to him only for own profit. After that, Jocelyn asked uh, forgiveness from the stonemaker and Roger killed Pendle because of his relationships with Gooby. Uh, Jocelyn calls the sculptor in the end to tell him what kind of headstone he wants. The main idea is nothing happened without sin and only God knows where God is. In the spy, God is married to Pangle, the impotent servant of the cathedral. At the beginning of the novel, she is described by Dean Jocelyn as his daughter in God, and he holds her up as an example of how women should be silent and obedient in opposition to the more vulgar Rachel. Overall, there is no uh, overt struggle between good and evil in this poem. The author shows that each of us has both in us. He draws parallels to situations absolutely similar to our daily life. Once you understand the full meaning of this work, you realize that some problems grow backwards through the years. The bishop sends the nail from the cross of Jesus. The abbot sees this as another miracle. The confessor shares the news and he demands a receipt that's no longer necessary to supervise the construction site. The rainy deceased worker who fell from a height. There are rumors about the onset of the plague. It weighs on Jocelyn. In the spring, the spire grows slowly, but the water erodes the soil and it crumbles. Roger tries to leave again without finishing the spire. One day, a bad weather happens in the city. Jocelyn drives an iron nail into the spire to preserve the structure. Then he falls ill. Jocelyn has a quarrel with his confessor, Father Anselm. He doesn't want to follow the construction. Jocelyn insists that Father Anselm has to go to the cathedral. The abbot understands that friendship will come to an end, such as the price of the spire, but he willingly makes sacrifices. Roger, the bricklayer, determines that the base of the structure will not support a spire for 100 feet high. The abbot tries to convince the bricklayer to believe the miracle, but Roger stands his ground and does not want to build a spire. Roger's wife arrives to begin with teach Jocelyn. At the end of the conversation, the bricklayer promises to build a spire as far as possible. He was laughing, chin up and shaking his head. God the Father was exploding in his face with the glory of sunlight through a painted glass.
a glory that moved in his movements to consume and exalt Abraham and Isaac and then God again. Tears of lava in his eyes made additional spokes and wheels and rainbows. Chin up, hands holding the model of the spire before him, half eyes closed, joy. I've waited half my life for this day. Opposite him, the other side of the model of the cathedral on a trestle table stood the chancellor, his face with a dark shadow over ancient pallor. I don't know, my lord Dean, I don't know. He peered across at the model of the spire where Jocelyn held it so firmly in both hands. His voice was but thin and wandered vaguely into the large, high air of the chapter house. But if you consider that this small piece of wood, how long is it? Eighteen inches, my lord chancellor. Eighteen inches? Well, yeah. It represents, does it not, construction of wood, stone, and metal? 400 feet high. The Chancellor moved out in the sunlight, hands up to his chest and peered around him. He looked up for the roof. Jocelyn looked sideways at him, loving him. The foundation. I know, but God will provide. The Chancellor had found what he was looking for, a memory. Ah, yes. Then, in ancient business, he crept away over the pavement to the door and threw it. He left a message in the air behind him. Matins, of course. Jocelyn stood still and shot arrow of love after him. My place, my house, my people. He will come out of the vestry tail of the procession and turn left, as he always done. Then he will remember and turn right to the Lady Chapel. So Jocelyn laughed again. She lifted in a holy ma. I know they all, know what they are doing and will do, know what they have done. All these years I have gone on, put the place on me like a coat. He stopped laughing and wiped his eyes. He took the white spa and jammed it firmly in the square hole cut in the old model of the cathedral. There. The model was like a man lying on his back. The nave was his legs placed together and transcripts on either side where his arms are spread. The nave was his legs placed together. The transcript on either side where his arms are spread. The choir was his body, and the Lady Chapel, where now the service would be held, was his head. And now also, springing, projecting, bursting, erupting from the heart of the building, there was its crown and majesty, the new spire. They don't know, it felt they can't know until I tell them of my vision. And laughing gay for joy, he went up to the chapter house to the sun piled into the open square of the cloisters. And I must remember that the spire isn't everything. I must do as far as possible exactly what I have always done. So he went round the cloisters, lifting curtain after curtain until he came to the side door into the west end of the cathedral. He lifted the latch carefully so as not to make a noise. He bowed his head as he passed through and said as he always did in Italy, lift up your heads or your gates but even as he stepped inside, he knew that his caution was unnecessary since there was a whole confusion and noise in the cathedral already. Matins diminished in cell so small that it might be held in one hand was nonetheless audible from the Lady Chapel at the other end of the cathedral, beyond the wood and canvas screen. They were talking, ordering, shout sometimes, dragging water across pavement with villain and dropping loads, then stones and rustling into place. So that the total noise would have been formless as the noises of the marketplace. No decoy space made a chase round and round, so that you got up with yourself in the shrill choir and think endlessly on one note. The noises were so new that he heard the center line of the cathedral, 
in the shadow of the great west door, genuflected to the hidden high altar, and then stood, looking. He had looking for a moment that he had been some before, but not like this. The most seeming sole thing in the nave was in the barricade of food and camp that cut the cathedral in two, as the choir said, was not the true arcade of the nave, nor the chantress and painted dumpsters within them. The most solid thing was a light. It smashed through the rows of window in the soul's ale, so that it exploded with color. It slanted before him, from right to left, in exact formation, to hit the bottom yard of the pills on the north side of the nave. Everywhere. Fine. Dust gave the throats and trunks of the light the importance of the dimension. He blinked at them again, seeing near at hand how the individual grains of dust turned over each other or bounced all together, like mine fly in breeze of wind. He saw how farther away their drifts cloudly, coiled, or hung in the moment of pause becoming in the most distant rods of trunks nothing but color, honey color slashed across the body of cathedral. Where the soul's transept lighted the crossways from the hundred and fifty foot of grizzly, the honey tinkled in the pillars that lifted straight as a bells from the men walking with crows at the pavement. He shook his Rifle wonder of the solid sunlight. If there are not a bell's pillar, he thought, I would take the importance level of light to be true dimensioned, and so believe that stone steep lay around of her side. And he smiled a little to think how the mind touched all things with love, yet deceives. In itself as easily as child. Facing the barricade of wood and canvas at the other end of the nave, now that the canvas had gone from the side altars, I could think this was some sort of pagan temple. And those two men posed so essentially in the sun dust with their crows, and the presence of some outlandish right forgive me. In this house for 150 years we have woven a rich fabric of constant praise, things shall be as they were, only better, richer, the pattern of worship complete at last, I must go to pray. And then he was aware that he wouldn't go to pray yet, even on this great day of joy, and he laughed aloud for pure joy knowing why he would not go, knowing as of old the daily pattern, knowing who was hunting, who preaching, who debitizing for whom, knowing the security of the stone ship, the security of her crew. As if the knowing was cue for an entry in an interlude, he heard a latch lift in the northwest corner and a door creak open. I shall see, as I see daily, my daughter in God. Sure enough, if his memory of her had called in, she came quickly through the door, so that he stood, waiting with his blessing for her as always. But Pangle's wife turned to her left, lifted a hand against the dust. He had only time to glimpse that long, sweet face before she had gone up the north aisle instead of coming straight across, so that he had to think his blessing after her. He watched her with love and little disappointment as she passed the unlighted altars of the north aisle. So her pulled back her hood so that the white wimple showed, got a glimpse of green dress as a grey cloak soon back. She is entirely woman, he thought, loving her, and this foolish, this childish curiosity shows it. But that's a matter for Pangle of Father Anselm. And as if she recognized her own fully, he saw how she circled the pit quickly, one hand up against the dust crossed the nave and clashed the door of the kingdom behind her, he nodded, soberly. I suppose after all it must make some difference to us. After the clash of the door there was near silence. Then in the silence a new little noise, tap, 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 
he turned to his left. And there the dumb man sat in the plinth of the north arcade in his leather apron, the lump of stone between his knees. Tap, tap, tap. I think he made you choose me, Gilbert, because I stand still so much. The dumb man got quickly to his feet. Jocelyn smiled at him. Of all the people connected with this thing, I must seem to do least, don't you think? The dumb man smiled dog-like and hemmed with his empty mouth. Jocelyn laughed back delightedly and nodded as if they shared the secret. Ask the four pillars as the crossways. It's true. After all these years of work and striving, glory be. For they were doing the unthinkable. I have walked by there for years, he thought. There was outside and inside, as clearly divided as internally, inventably divided as yesterday and today. The smooth stone on the inside, patterned and traced with the paint, and rubbed the lake and stuff on the outside. Yesterday, or a hell merry ago, they were a quarter of a mile apart. Yet now, the air blows through them. They touch. There were separate sides. I can see, as through a spy hole, right across the close of the corner of the chancellor's house, where perhaps Iva is. Courage! Glory be! It's a final beginning. It was one thing to let him dig pit where they were close away, like a grave for some notable. This is different. No lay in hand on the very body of my church, like a surgeon. I take my knife to the stomach drug with Papi. And his mind played for a while with the fancy of the drug, thinking that thin sound of mountains was slow breathing of the drug body, where it lay stretched on its back.